Hey everybody, so today we are going to learn to steal a piece of art from the art museum. Well, actually what we're gonna learn is how to use photogrammetry to take photos in the art museum and turn them into a 3D sculpture. Now, I'm gonna start off with the data set and we're gonna be using a program for Windows called a 3DF Zephyr, which is pretty awesome because there's a free version they have for it. As a matter of fact, I have that software right here, uh, 3DF Zephyr Free. And the free version of the software allows you to use 50 photos in your model. And that's going to be enough to do quite a bit of stuff here. Now, this isn't going to be foolproof and this isn't going to be perfect and everything is going to be good for photogrammetry. But it's a great exercise in really seeing how things work. And it's going to be just a quick little demo of how I'm going to put it all together. All right. So there's my software. Let's go back and look at the pictures. So here I have literally 50 photos from the Clean Museum of Art that were taken as good as could be. And the reason I say that is, is that the sculpture is quite large. And so there are really different uh, ro rows of images, but I can only go, or you can only go so high when you're looking at it because obviously uh, people aren't very tall. The trick is there are at least three rows of photos in this one taken from above and from below and around waist level. It'd be nice if I had some images that were taller or even from further below, but again, I'm only limited to 50 photos and so 50 photos it will be. The real trick is you want to make sure that in the photos, there's very few things that are not supposed to be there. So you can see that there's some people in the background here. Ideally, there wouldn't be there because that's something that's not going to be in, it's going to be in one photo and not another. Another consideration is making sure there's enough texture for it to work off of. It really is using a texture, so it can't just be, you know, total solid colors or things like that. You want to avoid areas of high reflectivity or things that are very, very skinny. So there's things that you can do with photogrammetry, and there are things that you can't. But here we have is 50 photos, and that's what we're going to work with. The other thing you want to make sure that you do is you do not change your camera zoom level. So if you're if you're medium, stay medium. If you're zoomed in, stay zoomed in. If you're wide, don't do it because you don't want to use a wide angle lens with photogrammetry anyway. So here they are, 50 photos, and I'm about to get started. Now I could press one magic button in 3DF Zephyr and have it do the whole damn thing, but where's the learning? Where's the educational value in that? New project. Now, I am not going to compute the 3D model. I am not going to compute the texture. I'm not going to, I am going to check for online pre-computed camera calibrations because that is actually very good. I'm going to do this nice and slow for you. And I'm going to come over here and I'm going to add my 50 photos. I'm going to go to my desktop and I'm going to find, there's my photogrammetry folder, control A, open. And there I have 50 images to be used. And I hit next and it's immediately going to go, I know that camera, which is great by the way, because cameras have lens aberrations and this is actually going to take care of that automatically. I then hit next. And it's going to ask me, what am I looking at from an orientation preset? Now, I could say it's a human body because it's a sculpture of a human body, but I'm going to leave it as general, and I'm going to leave everything as as, as default. I go fast, I can go deep, but I'm going to come over here and, uh, and do defaults. I'm always tempted to go deep, by the way. I'm always tempted to actually, you know, do the best... Uh, possible and see what's happening. But uh, matter of fact, you know, for our demo here today, I am going to do this as good as possible. And I'll, I'll, I'll just pause the video in between. So you won't have to wait while I wait. I hit next and I hit run. And what it's going to do, and it's going to, and boy, is it going to literally kill my computer. You can watch the CPU go up and down. What it's going to do is you can even hear the fan going. It's great. What it's going to do is it's going to look at every one of those photos and see if it can find matching points. And if it can find matching points in those photos, it is going to try to reverse place those photos in those cameras in space. So it's got 50 cameras, 50 photos, but it's going to try to use the different points inside of the images to place the cameras in space. And once it's placed those cameras in space, it's going to create what's called a sparse cloud. And that sparse cloud is going to be enough to be able to say, here's where the cameras are. And that's all that it's doing right now. Again, look at the CPU go. Um, if, if I, the better GPU you have, the better CPU you have, the better you can make this stuff go faster. But that is what this is. So uh, it says it only has 23 seconds left to go. So maybe I will vamp a little bit because I know the second sec is going to take a lot longer. But again, there's multiple steps, but I want to do each step separately so you can understand what's going on. So the software is looking at the images, 
looking for comparable points, matching those points up, and then seeing how things difficult, and triangulating in space the relationship between the cameras. You see it just jumped back and forth there. And now I pause. All right, we're back. And interestingly enough, it says 50 photos out of 50 photos have been oriented, which is great because if it rejected some photos, that would be data that I could have used. And so for imagine that you actually captured 60 photos and you grabbed 50 and then five were rejected. Well, now I can go back and delete those five, put the other five back in and try to find the best data set possible. But I don't have to do that. And if I had finished, what you're going to see is a couple of interesting things here. And the first thing you're going to see is those little dots. And those dots are the cameras. You see those cameras? Those dots represent where the cameras are in space. And you can see how nicely they were taken around in a circle. And you can also see that some are pointing up and some are pointing down. And again, it knows where they are. The other thing that you can see is this, again, sparse cloud. And this sparse cloud is fascinating because yes, it did get the object, but if you zoom out, you're gonna go, wait a second, it, did, it got a lot more than that. It actually saw objects in the background. Every object, notice it didn't get the walls because the walls are plain white, so it didn't know how to geometrically align those because there's something to grab onto. But every background sculpture that one, when multiple images saw it, they actually created those sculptures as well. So you actually have a map of the entire room. Look at that. Not only do you have the entire room, but this is a doorway that leads out to another room, and you can see all that as well. So we could, if we wanted to, you know, look at the ceiling, look at all that data there. It's amazing how much data is here. But this data is really not about the room yet. This data is really about the fact that this is the data that shows you how the cameras have been aligned. So there they are, the sparse cloud and the cameras. Now, one of the things that I could do at this point, if I wanted to, is I could eliminate some of this sparse cloud data. I'm actually not going to. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you what happens, but then I'm going to go back in time and show you what happens as well. What do I mean by that? So the next step is to go from the sparse cloud to the dense cloud. And so while the images showed you where the cameras were, now the cameras are going to show you where the data is. It's kind of a backwards and forwards thing. And so under workflow, you're going to see it says 3D model generation. Under advanced, there's dense point cloud generation, which is what I'm going to do, is I'm going to go to the dense point cloud generation. I'm literally going step by step. And again, the, the automated mode does it all at once, but this is an educational video. I want you to see each step along the way. Now, when I do this, it's going to say, excuse me, which cameras? Obviously, the 50 cameras I've already created. And if I hit next, it's going to say general again. And then for presets, I can go preview, default, or high detail. Oh my goodness, I think we're going to go for high detail because I really want to see this as well as it can be. And if I hit next, I can hit run. And that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to hit run. Now, after, let, it, let it run first. It's going to take a few minutes. After I run through this, and it uses basically the entire data set to build this entire dense cloud, then I'm going to make a decision about whether I want to edit this dense cloud before I create a 3D model? The answer is yes, by the way. Um, editing the sparse cloud before I make the dense cloud, it does work, but I don't necessarily need to do that. I could if I wanted to. And that's the nice thing about this is you can do each of these. But now I've got another 22 minutes to sit here while you just watch time vanish. I'm just gonna pause. And we're back. And the dense point cloud generation is successful. Now, if I click on finish, you're gonna see it looks very different. So now if we look over here, you're gonna see that over here I have the sparse cloud and now over here I have the dense cloud and there it is. And if I click, if I zoom in, you can see just how much data there is. Isn't that beautiful? And look behind you, look at all of that. So all those other sculptures were captured in the room. Look at that, I, I love this. Look how much, look, look how much data. And this is just, again, a cloud of data. Look at that. Look at that data cloud. And again, I went for the, the ultra high res version and I do not regret it at all. So what's the next step? Well, and let me look at that. Look at the ceiling, look at the floor. Well, the next step is I, could, oh, look at the base. I just, I, I love it when it comes together. And I could turn off the dense point cloud and I can turn on the sparse point cloud and you can really see the difference between 
the two. I mean, there it is. That's that's so much data. There's going to be some holes. Obviously, there's, there's you know, we we didn't get the bottom. You didn't get the very very top. But this is really really good. So what's the next step? So we align the cameras and we have the sparse cloud and we have the dense cloud. Well, now we need to turn the cloud into a mesh. Connect the dots. So we come over to workflow, and I you know so I keep going to advance. And I'm doing that on purpose because I want to do it slowly. And I'm going to do mesh extraction. And when I do that, it's going to go, all right, I'll make a mesh, but from what? And notice, by the way, it says dense point cloud one, which is only one of them. What that means, though, is, is if I go back in 10 minutes and delete from the dense point cloud data I don't want, I can decide which point cloud I want to work from. But for now, we're just going to go through and do this as is. And then later on, I'll come back and clean it up. Next, uh-oh, preset. Go for high detail. Love them details. Next, and run. Now, how long is this gonna take? I don't wanna know. And you don't have to wait, because I'm just gonna hit pause. And we're back, and it created the mesh successfully. Now let's see, look what it did. All right, now this is where it, look at all the bits and pieces it grabbed, look at that. See that, all the other bits and pieces it grabbed? But let's come back over here and look at what we really care about. Look at that. That is just amazing. And that is just crazy. And you're like, this isn't very good. No, this is good. Think about this. This was done with photographs. This is done with photographs. This is a great start. Um, there's, there's the hole in the head. That is so nice. All right. So what's the next step? Well, we only have one more step before I go back and show you what else you can do in the software. And what that last step is, is I'm going to take my mesh workflow and I'm going to do a textured mesh generation. And what that's going to do is it's going to create a textured overlay on the mesh. This is not a texture, by the way. This is just a colored mesh that's different than the textured mesh. So I'm going to do textured mesh. I'm going to use mesh one. Again, you can choose which mesh you're texturing. You can choose which dense cloud you're creating a texture, a, a mesh from. It's so cool. I hit next, general, and ooh, I'm going to go with high details again because we love high details. Next, and run. And back to the pausing. And we're back. Textured mesh complete, and wow. Look at that. That is done. And if I wanted to, oh, that is just gorgeous. And, and again, look at that one. Look at that one. Look, look, look at this model that it has made in the background. It made this model in the background from the pictures in the background. I mean, that's obviously not great, but I mean, it's great considering that this was not the subject of any of the photos. But there it is. There it is. All right. So what are we going to do now? What's the point of this? Well, if I wanted to, I could hit export and I could be done and I could say, hey, I made all this stuff. But I want to back up a little bit and I want to back up a little bit and I want to back up. I can, I can back all the way up to the sparse cloud. I don't need to back up that far. Let me back up to the dense cloud. And if I back up to the dense cloud, I can make a decision about what it is that I want to keep. So what I'm going to do, and boy, there is data here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to... Um, and everyone's going to laugh at me because I could be doing this so much more elegantly, but I'm going to do it nice and slow. I'm going to come over here to Tools, Selection, Manual Selection. Grab my good old-fashioned lasso tool, and I'm going to grab a lasso around my object, which selects it. Yay, selected. Now that I've selected it, I can come over back to Selection, and I can invert my selection which means I now have selected everything but that object. Delete, it's gone, done. Now I have a much smaller data set. There's still other data around here, by the way. I have to double check. I can't tell if there's dust on my screen or actual data. Let me close this and see what is it that I've done. Oh yeah, so there's probably some data up here that I don't want. And if I wanted to, I could decide how much of this I'm gonna carve away. Again, very straightforward. Selection, 
manual selection. You notice, by the way, there were things that you could select by color. Selecting by color is amazing if you're like doing outdoor stuff, right? So you're like, I don't want the sky dots. And you just kind of pick the right color and it's gone. So I've done that. And then um, hmm, I'm going to just make a decision about the base. Let's come over here and zoom in. And I'm going to decide how much of the base I'm going to cut off because I don't want to, I don't want all of this base. So I'm going to come over here like that. And mm -hmm. all right, so I'm going to kind of cut off at the base here. Make it go way up there, so I don't want any of that. So you can see all that other stuff out there. All right, and there's other ways of selecting. Whatever, whatever way you feel like selecting is better. If you want to use a box, that's fine. Use a box or a polygonal lasso. But I'm just going to come over here and grab my lasso tool and say I don't want that. Look at all that extra data. Boom. And then I'm going to rotate the model again. Look at it from this side. Yep, there's data out here I don't want to. And do one more time. And I don't want that. And again, I'm doing this with the dense cloud because if I do it with the dense cloud, then it'll make my life easier. The data that I get rid of now is means that when I go from dense cloud to mesh, that it's going to make a mesh that doesn't have that data in it. So if there's anything else I could see, especially if you're dealing with like weird colors and stuff, if I could get in here and say, oh, that, those pixels don't belong there. If I could do that, that would be great. But I... I think I can get in there that much. I'm good, but I don't think I don't think I have much more to go here because this really did a precision job. Look at that. I mean, I don't really see a lot of extraneous stuff here. But now that I've done this, I've got this this sort of reduced point cloud. I guess there's a little bit of data there. You see that? See a little bit of, of fluffy data there? I could I, I'm gonna get rid of that this one more time. Again, the, the, the more you do now, the less you have to do later. So I can come over here. Oops. Not by color. And selection. Lasso. There's those dots. And those dots. So it did work. I did get rid of the rest of the day. All right. So, right, so now I'm done. Beautiful. Yada, yada. Come up here. And I've got to go back. And I'm going to do it again. But now... It's going to ignore all that other data when it does it. So it's not, it's not only going to be faster, but it's going to be cleaner. So now I'm going to go back to workflow, advanced. Um, I don't need to generate a new dense point cloud because I already have a dense point cloud. Uh, that is what I just finished editing. But I'm going to make a new mesh from that dense point cloud, which I only have one of. And I hit next. And again, high details, next, and run. And we're going to see that this mesh is going to be different than the last mesh. And it's going to take a few minutes to generate and it's done and like last time it's there but there's nothing else there see is that nice well look at that i don't think that's supposed to be there and this is where it gets interesting what do i do with the stuff that i don't like well i go back and i keep editing but unlike editing before, where I edited, and remember, both meshes, there's mesh one is still there. There's mesh one, and this is mesh two. See how that's different? And again, it's because of how I did things like this. So now I've got to decide, how am I going to edit this? Now, I'm not going to edit the, 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 the dense point cloud. I'm going to come over here and edit this. I can only do so much here, but uh, let's see what I can do. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to use my selection tools again. There, there they are again, my selection tools. Select by point, by points, by plane. Now I'm just going to do manual selection. And I'm just going to come over here. And I'm going to start deleting things like that. Look, oh, look at that. I just deleted stuff that I don't want. And I look so goofy doing this because uh, this is not my fun part. But you get the general idea. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to start freeing this stuff up and, you know, getting in there and deleting what I don't want. So what do I do now? And the answer is I've got to fix the holes. There's holes up in the ceiling. There's probably holes in the body somewhere. I'm just not seeing them. And there's definitely, there's definitely a hole down here because obviously 
there's no there's a hole in the base. So what do I do with that? Well, the answer is I fill them. Notice, by the way, I'm going to fill them before I retexture this, which I think is really important to remember. So I'm going to come over here to Utilities, to Tools, and under Mesh Filters, you're going to see Fill Holes Selective and Fills Holes Watertight. And if I say Fill All, making sure I'm on Mesh too, by the way, always make sure you're doing the right mesh. What it's going to do is it's going to look for all the holes and it's going to fill them. And boy, is it using CPUs to do that. So now that it's done that, what you're gonna notice is, is that weird things happened up top, which we knew would happen because I did I kind of left it messy. But if I come down to the bottom, you'll see that it has filled it, it has completed that. And so that really tells me what's going on over here. So if I was more careful, I could have trimmed it along and I could do that again. I could go back and I could trim and fill the hole and I go back and forth. But the idea being is, oh, look at that, look at that, it's so wild. The idea being is, is that in this program, I can choose to keep editing the model. I can edit the model at the mesh level and I can fill the holes as needed. So now, what do I do? I come back over here. I've got Mesh 2, Workflow, Textured Mesh Generation of Mesh 2. There it is, not Mesh 1, Mesh 2. Next, High Details, next, Run. See you in a few minutes. And there it is, textured. Oh, look, it's, it's so gorgeous. That's just so gorgeous. Look at that. Now, what's fun about this is you could save the project. Uh, three is free, does allow me to hit Control S, save the project. I could call this my um, CMA project. And that would allow me to open up this and all the other data that I have, which means I'd be able to look at the textured meshes, the meshes, the point clouds. I'd be able to come back and edit this all I would want. I mean, again, it's not perfect, but damn, there's some really good stuff here. I should spend the time to clean it up, but I'm not going to because this is a demo. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. All right. So now that I've done that, um, now that I have done this, what am I going to do with the next? Well, I'm going to export it. Export, textured mesh. I go right to Sketchfab, or I'm going to do a GLB file, and I can limit the file size. By the way, even before I do that, if I come back over to Utilities, um, you know, there are other things that I can do here. For instance, I can I can I can do a, a decimation if I wanted to make it smaller. I can do smoothing. There's so many different things that I can do here. That you really need to look into this. But the reality of it is, is, the big one is the decimation. If you wanted to make things smaller, but I'm going to leave it big. Export that textured mesh as a uh, GLB file. And I'm going to keep all my data as is. I'm going to come over here. I'm going to say big, big CMA sculpture. Um, let it save. And while it's doing that, let me navigate to where it is. I think I stuck it in the, this folder here. Big, there it is, big, big CMA sculpture. I double click on that and let's view it in the 3D viewer. And it's 19 megabytes, by the way. And there it is. So all of that done with 50 photographs. But it's not just the 50 photographs. It's the eye. The eye of what you can capture, how you use your camera, how you keep the good photos, how you get, again, 50 photos. This 3D model was done from 50 photos. And then lastly, you still gotta clean it up and nothing's perfect. All right, my name's Jared. I hope you enjoyed the demo. It was pretty quick, wasn't it? And again, I'll put a link into 3D stuff for free. There is a pro version, by the way, where you get more than 50 photos, but then you better be prepared to wait. You you were waiting long for me, but I've done projects with you know hundreds of photos. And you better have RAM, hardware space, GPU, CPU, and a hell of a lot of patience. All right, I'm Jared. Leave some comments. I'm sure you have a better way of doing it. That's fine. Just enjoy this for what it is. Thanks for watching.